So I'm going to talk about post-revolutionary poetry in terms of its geography, the landscapes, sceneries and national landmarks which could suggest. Beyond that there is a sort of politics which hasn't been in Persian poetry for centuries and for thousands, thousands of years. So post-revolutionary poetry started in 1979, the time of revolution, two years after we have Iran-Iraq war, then eight years of war, and then the time of reform started. If we want to do a little bit of comparison with pre-revolutionary poetry, we can say that uh, mm, contemporary poetry already started using new styles uh, and it has been highly innovative uh, in terms of style, subject matters, just importing new ideas. And um, it was nature poetry, if we want to talk about Nima's poetry, we've got, we've got lots of pastoral scenes. So um, that kind of mystical poetry, or um, I can say uh, Indian style of, uh, Indian school of Persian poetry turned to a kind of nature poetry which was true to life. That kind of poetry was a kind of ornamental um, oriental handicraft and Nima changed it to um, nature poetry. Actually Nima talks to Hafez and talks to uh, Persian poet has got a kind of controversy with them in his famous um, verse poem the legend in this poem he says that it's a kind of lie that you're talking um, with uh, this set terminology like the cup bearer and um, wine and these are perhaps you don't have any ideas about the, the real objects and then he started to import some range of vocabulary which was not very common in the past in classical poetry and then we've got patriotic poet poets at the time of constitutions and then uh, later we've got social utopian themes mainstream poetry was a kind of social utopian poetry left-wing poets advertise that as we have in Siavash Kasra'i's poetry after the revolution when he Im immigrates to Russia he speaks in a different way he says that uh, um, in the northern side of Persian Caspian Sea you see different things you see different ideas the, so he's got a very nostalgic poem about the Caspian Sea and the northern coast of Caspian Sea and he, he says something which is totally different from the past. Even he told his um, his close friend Hushangev Tahaj that all he thought about that kind of socialist utopia like a shared society, free society, a society with no gap, no discrimination was a kind of delusion. And now he has come to reality that Russia was um, advertising the hegemony of colonialism in Iran by that kind of two-day party. And then uh, after the revolution we've got the sceneries of war. These are quite Mesopotamian sceneries like the river Karun, Arvand Rud, waterways in the south and then um, Persian Gulf. You, you, you see the time that it's changed its name to Arabian Gulf in geographical maps, lots of poets wrote about it and it became a kind of nostalgic icon as the islands in Persian Gulf belong to Iran, that this Hormuz Strait has belonged to Iran for centuries, even before the time of Islam. And then uh, let me talk a little bit about diaspora poetry. Diaspora poetry took, did um, a great job, I can say. They um, played a great role in post-revolutionary poetry in this case that they could, um, they could just, uh, they could import some 
some national icons and they 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 just created a kind of imaginary homeland based on their ideas and based on ancient iran and based on whatsoever you can call uh, historical iran though it's nostalgic but it's based on a kind of identity those who traveled or immigrated and they were in exile they thought that they've got something in the background this is their true identity and the true identity is so rich perhaps the next generation is not going to learn persian and is not going to be familiar with the past let's write about it and let's save it this way and then uh, let's talk about some classical themes which has been refined after the revolution. A poet like Bijan Elahi or some other poets who practiced mysticism before the revolution and it was suppressed by mainstream socialist poetry and the criticism which evaluated each single book based on its social value and not based on its literariness. So uh, then after the revolution, after two decades, they became fashionable, that kind of the highly use of imagery and uh, literary devices after the revolution and then language poetry and which was so innovative in terms of syntax semantics importing new and uh, uh, new ideas into poetry, changing the range of vocabulary, expanding the range of vocabulary, forgetting about the dead metaphors, cliches, and finding some new metaphors. So before the revolution, we had some certain metaphors, like the night was um, the metaphor of suppression. And the day was the metaphor of freedom. In Shamlou's poetry, you can see all these dead metaphors and lots of social utopian poets. That kind of despotic narrative with uh, the pronoun I or we, which is advertising something with the whole society, which is showing the whole society the right ways and the wrong ways. After the revolution, this was totally broken and it's lost its own values. So after the revolution, you can see that uh, mm, poets lost their hopes, true poets lost their hopes in, in those sorts of themes, and they got back to their own identity, like Persian mythology like some line, uh, lines of Shahnameh which was read at the time of Iran-Iraq war to Iran Nabashat Taneman Mabad. So uh, you can see that um, um, as we have seen this uh, trend of nationalism all over the world, it has come to Iran, this kind of high nationalism, um, believing in the glory of past and just reviving and recreating and rewriting that in poetry i can say mystical poet has uh, mystical poetry has been revived after the revolution in a way that you can see uh, the range of vocabulary has changed but the mentality is mystical just just i've got um uh, um I've got a, a very short poem that I'm sewing the buttons into my eyes to see the world from a different perspective. This is the mentality of uh, this is the mentality of mysticism that you've got a third eye to see the world from a better perspective, to see the world from above, as we have in poetry of Rumi. But uh, I try to do it in, in everyday setting with the objects around me, to talk about the objects around me. And a kind of phenomenological poetry in a way that you want to discover the, um, the, the life, the existence, uh, as if it has been exposed to you for the first time, as Heidegger says in Ahmad Reza Ahmadi's poetry and in my poetry also, this kinds of exposure to the primitive life, to the time that a poet is going to discover the universe, is going to discover all the happenings with, uh, with no medium, as the poet is so close to the nature, true to life, true to the nature, true to the existence. And we've got a kind of colloquial and slang poetry. Sayyid Ali Soleil practiced that, and one of his books became so popular, it's highly read among the youth, and it's been recorded. And the, the, the recording is so popular. Mosalasat Aishra Ha. Uh, 
um, one of his po 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 poetry books that I can mention right now. Then, um, at uh, the time of uh, workshop, the time that the establishment of creative poetry workshops in Iran, like Reza Barahani's Reza Barahani's workshop, was the first workshop, creative workshop. All right, after that, you can see lots and lots of workshops, like Kushan's workshop and Sayyid Ali Salehi's workshop, and lots of other creative work workshops because. Contemporary poetry has been ignored in uh, in academies because they think that contemporary poetry has got social values and they prefer not to teach contemporary poetry. They stick to old classical poetry and old fashionable ideas. Even some critics like uh, uh, Shafi Katkani, based on new, based on the contemporary criticism in the world, has got nothing to say these days, and is just repeating and sticking to some old-fashioned ideas and criticizing the mainstream creative poetry which is um, which uh, uh, causes lots of anger among creative poets and then um, you can see that the, the high translation had creative Persian poetry a lot like in a country in Iran we've got the most translated books and we've got creative work but it's not seen in the West in Western eyes still they want to ignore post-revolutionary poetry they still look for some trends of pornographic poetry as they have seen in Farooq Farooqzad's poetry after the revolution but it's not possible to find out those themes these days or it's rare on uh, underground not published that much and then um, so uh, the West has been ignorant and um, but um, I can say that creative poets in Iran are highly educated and sophisticated they know old uh, they know uh, world poetry very well they are familiar with American poet creative creative American poetry and they are familiar with English poetry and world poetry and they are familiar with literary theories and literary criticism so that kind of formalists saying that a poet a poem should be judged based on its literariness came into fashion um, in these two decades if you take a look at old uh, uh, old reviews of Reza Barohani you can see that he used to evaluate poetry based on its social values but um, in these two decades he became familiar with the literariness and he gave value to the literariness of that language so what he said about Sohrab Sepehri's poetry who was a very creative poetry who was a surrealist poetry experience some creative uh, styles of uh, creative styles and creative themes and then um, I can say post-revolutionary poetry owes to Sohrab Seferi who was a very creative poet post-revolutionary poetry owes to Mehdi Akhaban Sales who was a great poet and experienced lots of national themes within mm, a kind of archaic language of Iran like a Ferdowsi who could revive lots of national icons and Persian mythology in his poetry but some critics like, like Reza Barahani and Shamlu tried to ignore Sohrab Seferi and Akhavan Sales who became the mainstream after the revolution highly read so you can see uh, even common people know Sohrab Seferi by heart they can say some lines of Sohrab Seferi by heart and then uh, at the time of reform I can say the freedom of press is quite obvious there are lots of newspapers who wrote about poetry lots of literary journals who write about poetry and then um, so you can see that um, and you, you can see that um, in the f female poetry has flourished after the revolution. Before the revolution, female poetry was a kind of confessional, erotic poetry. But after the revolution, women face the reality. They are living in the country on the Silk Road, a country which which has got its own geographical position, 
uh, it's got its own strategic position. Pe women became more educated. They experienced this kind of hectic, modern, industrial lifestyle. And uh, they experienced lots of struggles like social traumas, psychological traumas, and uh, they experienced mythological, mm, the, the mythological unconsciousness of their own feminine writing i can say you can see um, the, the demand the, the demands of females women in their poetry but this is uh, just the surface of poetry if you want to find a kind of feminine language women practice that kind of feminine language which is um, which which has the essence of females poets some uh, uh, male critics try to judge a female's writing by saying that it's emotional, romantic, sentimental or so. So it's a kitchen um, literature or so, but actually um, I cannot say um, there are not any cliches. There could be some cliches. It's good to get further and find a kind of true literature which has a kind of local color and it's feminine and it's Iranian. You know, Persian language doesn't have um, female and masculine pronouns. Uh, uh, um, the verbs are not formed in feminine and masculine forms. So uh, the language has got uh, um, um, a kind of compatibility. And if you want to write a kind of feminine literature, you're supposed to do it with some signs and semiotics and get through to the moment of joy that a woman um, has got this moment of joy in poetry mm, the, the moment that you get the, the the pleasure of feminine writing and then um, I can say that domestic lifestyle has turned to a kind of industrial lifestyle and uh, you cannot see um, generally if you want to talk about either female or male poetry you can see that um, the pastoral themes has lost its uh, own values if you've got uh, some signs and symbols like a kind of symbolic language it's just uh, uh, um, a kind of sy symbolic language based on Iranian mythology, Persian mythology. And then uh, let me talk about uh, uh, let me talk about um, ac ac actually publishing industry. So uh, it wasn't uh, very common to publish poetry books, creative poetry books like um, just the, the classical books but recently you can see there is a trend among publishers there's a kind of co competition to publish creative poetry and I think your creative poetry is going to be read much more these days because um, though um, cinema and music are um, entertainments for people and these days you you could see that educated people need to read and they they think that uh, it gives them a sense of comfort or uh, it could give them a, a kind of view and uh, a, a special perspective towards life and the happenings. A poet which is highly read these days is Garus Abdul Malikyan. He's got a very uh, simple language, but he's got a very complicated mind and uh, mm, special themes. The themes he mentions are mm, not very simple. He, he talks about um, the society, sometimes from the point of view of a skeptic, sometimes from the point of view of somebody who wants to show a kind of wisdom to the society. I like his poetry because I think you, you cannot divide to poetry to simple and difficult. In my own poetry, which is a kind of polyphonic, polysemic poetry, I've got different voices, different narratives, and sometimes the language is quite simple, sometimes the language is difficult, sometimes the language is journalistic, sometimes scientific, sometimes quite archaic. I try to mingle all these styles and try to do a kind of patchwork based on fragmentary 
um, fragmentary pieces of my poetry I create a kind of poetry which has got uh, different voices there are different discourses it's um, there there um, there are different levels of language like uh, a kind of very prestigious language uh, archaic language and then I've got uh, quite uh, uh, quite a lot of street talk and I, I've written about the streets of Tehran a lot I've written about Tehran a lot and so at the end I can say uh, I can just recommend the scholars of Persian poetry to read much more about post-revolutionary poetry and to, to write more about it it has been ignored for four decades it's too late to stop